Hello, biblical counselors. How you doing? Hey, let's start off with the definition of biblical counseling. Everyone together. What is biblical counseling? Do you know I heard you guys? Whoa, that was really loud. Changing behavior biblical. I heard that from the camera. Good job, guys. Hey, hope you guys are doing well. I brought something really special with me today. I brought, ooh, I brought Dr. Shetler's famous magic wand. So I want to ask you all something today. If I had a magic wand and I could send it to you and you could take it, and then you have to mail it to the next person, but you could take it and change one thing about your life, what would you change? What would you change about you if you had a magic wand, oh, I'd make myself taller. I've been too short all my life. Oh, I'd make myself shorter. I've been too tall. I'd give a different complexion. I'd like different kind of hair. My nose, I'd like to change. My ears, I would like to have different parents. I, you know, I'd like to change my parents and, and what's happened in my life. Or Stop. Do you realize that what you would change may be exactly what God ordered for your life? Look at our notes today in lecture number 10, inferiority, the right view of you, the right view of you. And we're going to talk today about inferiority. Uh, if you had a magic wand that you could use to change anything in your life, what would you change? Remember, before you make a change, God might have a reason why he brought that into your life or made you that way. Inferiority is getting your worth from the world. Superiority is getting your worth from your flesh. All right, stop. That was a really good statement that you need to know. Inferiority is getting your worth from the world. Because my friend, I just want to tell you something. If you're getting your value and worth from the world, you feel inferior. Because there's always someone better looking. There's always someone more talented. There's always somebody smarter. There's always somebody richer. There's always someone better than you. If you're going to get your value from the world, you're going to always feel inferior. But isn't this interesting? If you get your value from the flesh, oh, I am really something. Oh, I am really, you become superior or it's with superiority. Superiority is getting your worth from your flesh inferiority is getting your worth from the world. Well, Dr. Schaller, if you don't get your worth from the world and you don't get your worth from your flesh, where do you get your worth and value from? Yeah, there's one other, God. And you get your value from God. You were created in the image of God. You get your identity from Jesus Christ, not from the world or from your flesh. Because both of those are going to cause problems. But when you get your value and worth from what God made and what God did in your life and the way he created you, then you find your identity in Christ, my friend, you're going to have great worth and value about who you are because of who God is. Let's look at this stuff. Number one, a definition of inferiority. You know, I've been pretty big on definitions. Viewing yourself is having little or no value as compared to others. There you go. Viewing yourself as having little or no value as compared to others. Large A. There are three terms that help us in our definitions, okay? One term is called self-concept. Say that with me. Self-concept. Number two, self, what does it say? Image. Say that. Self-image. And number three is called self-esteem. Say that with me, self-esteem. So we've got self-concept, self-image, self-esteem. Now hold on to those. Let's look at these. Self-concept and self-image have to do with the picture we have of ourself. Our self-image, our self-concept, the way that we picture ourselves. What we would consider our strengths and our weaknesses, our character traits, our personality, our physical features, the way we perceive ourselves. Included would be the thoughts and attitudes and feelings that we have about ourselves as well. Self-esteem is something different. 
This is our evaluation of our worth, our value, our competence, our significance. Self-image and self-concept in, uh, involve a self-description, while self-esteem is a self-evaluation. Number two. So what does the Bible say about self-esteem and inferiority? Well, the Bible emphasizes that human beings have worth to God. Even after man sinned, God said in Psalm 8, 5, For thou hast made him, man, a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. God sent his only son to die for us so that we could live forever with him. Hey, God did not send his son to die for the elephants. Now stop. Think about that for a minute. That's a species. God didn't send his son to die for, for reptiles or for birds or for fish. God sent his son to die for mankind because we were created in the image of God. There is a worth and a value to every individual human being that is not found with cattle. It's not found with dogs or cats. We have a value and a worth because we were created in the image of God. I'm not saying that animal life has no value. I am saying that there is not a comparison between other species and other things created. Praise God for trees. Praise God for the water. Praise God for mountains. They all have value and worth, but it doesn't compare to a human being's worth and value. The life of a soul, the sanctity of life is so important. Think about what we're doing in coronavirus to protect life. That's a natural thing because life has value to it. We were created for his pleasure. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Large B. As a result of Adam's sin, all men are sinners and therefore alienated from God and deserving of hell forever. In this fallen state, God still loves and values us. This is an amazing thought. Even after sin, man still has a value with God. Uh, one time I was speaking at a camp, and I went to a thrift store, and I got a, a mirror, a, just a real cheap mirror or whatever, and I brought a hammer to the morning chapel hour. And I took that hammer, and I looked, and I, and I got I, I, a pretty girl. I brought her up, you know, and I said, look into the mirror, and she saw her image. And I took the hammer, and everyone was like, no, no, no. But I took the hammer, and I just tapped that mirror, and it just shattered. Matter of fact, a couple pieces even fell out, and you could see right where the hammer hit, because for right there it was really fragmented, and then it splintered out. And I had the girl look into the mirror after I smashed it. I said, do you still see yourself? She said, I do, Brother Shetler, but I don't look the same. And I said, listen, and I had her go sit down, and I said, listen, campers, even after sin, the image of God is still in us, and that makes us still valuable. The life of a human being is still valuable even though we're depraved. We still have the image of God upon us. But it is when Christ comes in that that image begins to be renewed the way it's supposed to be, and there's even greater value in our identity in Christ. But let's continue on. In this fallen state, God still loves and values us. Sin breaks our relationship with God, but it does not destroy the fact that in God's sight, we are his creation and worthy of redemption. Think about that, that even as sinners, God thought we were worthy enough and valuable enough to die and send his son for. That's amazing. Number three, the causes of inferiority. Now, you got to get this. Um, number one, faulty theology. Faulty theology. Some have been taught that as human beings, we are worthless to God. Some teach that sin makes us insignificant to God. Now, let me tell you something. There is no false theology that has affected the view of man greater than the faulty theology of evolution. And evolution is a theology. It makes man God. 
And yet all we are is an evolved species and we are an animal with no more value, no more purpose, no more reason than anything else that's evolving on this earth. Let me tell you something. The fact of the matter is evolution has affected even you believer, even you Christian, struggle today with things in your life because of the evolutionary theories that were taught to us even as children. We still, we begin to treat ourselves, each other as animals and think that there's no other purpose and no other reason for living and that all things are amoral and all things are relative because of evolution. I'm telling you, it has destroyed our view of ourselves. Large B, sin. Yeah. Now listen to me. You do something wrong. You look at something you shouldn't have looked at. You act upon that. And what do you feel? You feel worthless, don't you? You feel guilt. And you feel like you're no good and God can't ever use you. You lose your purity one summer. And you feel like I'm a piece of trash. God can never use me. I'm worthless. You do something wrong and you beat yourself up. Now let me tell you something that will make you feel in fear more than anything else. Sin. And sin will destroy. Look what it says. When we violate God's standard or right uh, of right and wrong, we are going to feel guilt, remorse, and disappointment in ourselves. This contributes to our inferiority and ero erodes proper, proper self-esteem. Loss of purity. I'm telling you. Sin. Evolution. These things destroy the value of a human being. I'm not done though. Large C, past experiences from failures. Past experiences. Man, I've done wrong. I failed. And you, and you lose your value, your worth. Large D, parent-child relationships. Parent-child relationships. You know, most experts agree that low self-esteem esteem, most frequently begins early in life at home. Sometimes as parents, we've done things to make our children feel worthless or protected our children to such an extent they could never fail. And now they get out in life and they start failing and they have no worth and value because they were told they were the greatest thing in the world and now they fail. They don't know what to do with that. So they live in their parents' basement. When there is repeated criticism, shame, rejection, and scolding without any affirmation of worth, the child will dislike himself in direct proportion to the criticism he has received. I've been told all my life I'm no good. I've been told all my life I'm a failure. I've been told all my life that I have no value and no purpose. Well, guess what? They're going to struggle with inferiority. Inferiority develops when there are unrealistic standards and goals. Some of you have put this upon you. Some of you, have put, your parents have done this. Or your church has put on these unrealistic standards and goals. The expectation is that the child will fail. There is, a rare, there is rare praise or encouragement, compliments, and emotional support. Punishment is harsh and repeatedly done without proper explanation. It is implied that the child is a nuisance, stupid, or incompetent. Wow. That's going to destroy the child's value, worth to God. There is little or no cuddling, hugging, or affectionate touching. Boy, I think that's important. The child is overprotected and dominated so that he feels later when he is forced to live life on his own. And then I think there's community influences as well. I, let's look back at these. Faulty theology, evolution, sin past experiences from failure, parent-child relationships, community influences, media, schools, government, magazines show pictures of what a woman's supposed to, they say, supposed to look like. And a, and a, and a teenage girl looks at that and says, I don't look anything like that. Well, they feel inferior. They, they look at guys and at, at, at media and government. It talks about all these people that are athletes and whatever. And this is your model. And this is what you're supposed to be like. I don't look anything like that. I can't do anything like that. So all of these can also influence someone's worth or value. Number four, the effects of inferiority and low self-esteem. 
the effects of inferiority and low self-esteem. Inferiority produces a myriad of actions, attitudes, and emotions, which include a feeling of isolation, a feeling of being too weak to overcome their deficiencies, lacking drive to succeed or to defend themselves, a feeling of being too weak to overcome their deficiencies, lacking drive to succeed, to defend themselves. Difficulty in getting along with others. Jealous and critical of others. They're trying to tear others down and they're jealous of other people because they feel worthless. Self-criticism, self-hatred, and self-rejection. Depression. A drive to gain control, power, or superiority over others. An inability to accept compliments or expressions of love. Counseling inferiority. So how do you counsel this? Give the biblical perspective of self-esteem and self-worth. Well, how do you do that? We will get nowhere if the counselee is convinced that inferiority is the same as humility. Now stop. This is huge. Okay, so the very first thing we're going to do in giving counsel is give them a biblical thing, a biblical perspective. First of all, inferiority is not humility. Humility is not thinking terrible of yourself. Humility is not thinking of yourself, okay? Someone that thinks terrible of themselves is so self-conscious that it's dwelling and drowning in self-pity. That is not humility. Humility and inferiority, oh, I just don't think I'm worth anything. I don't, well, at least they're humble. No, they're not humble. They're very selfish and self-centered and all they can think about is themselves. So we will get nowhere if the counselee is convinced that inferiority is the same as humility and, and that self-esteem is the same as selfful pride. Yeah, that, well, if you have value worth, you're really full of pride. No, you're not. The second bullet point under this, the counselee must be shown that self-condemnation is both destructive and wrong. It's not beating up on yourself. Large B. Encourage self-disclosure and a realistic self-evaluation. Now we're going to start getting into some projects that you could give. By the way, you have ever give a project? What do you always what do you end every counseling session with? Everyone together. Project and hope, or hope in a project. When a person shares himself, his himself, his self-concept, feedback can be positive and show acceptance. Do not allow the counselee, however, to disclose the negative in order to receive a compliment, saying, I can't do anything right, in order for someone to say, oh, yes, you can, you did a great job. That doesn't solve the problem. Help the counselee to make a list of strengths and weaknesses. Let's get a realistic view of who you are. Evaluate that list. And show evidence as to why something should be, should or should not be on that list. Emphasize the strengths and show how those areas can be, be put uh, to better use. Large C, stimulate some goal setting. This is going to be really good. Now, they got to be first down markers, okay? They just got to get first downs. But stimulate goal setting. Long-range goals seem overwhelming and unattainable. And the person struggling with inferiority refuses to even try that. They'll never reach, they can't see that far down the field. Short-term goals give a sense of accomplishment towards a long-term project. Hey, you did it. Hey, great job on that chapter. That, that verse, very well done. Excellent job on the verse that I gave you last week to do. Those short-term accomplishments will begin to develop success and worth and value. Giving them responsibility is imperative in developing the right kind of self-image. If nobody has responsibility, they can't find any worth and value. Responsibility is imperative in developing the right kind of view of yourself. The more the counselee accomplishes that you gave him is responsible for, no matter how small, the more his self-image will improve. Large D, avoid destructive influences like sin. Stop getting this sin. Work on that sin habit in their life or whatever. Breaking that, that will give them great peace and great worth. 
any known sin in our life should be repented of and forsaken. Sin will create guilt, self-condemnation, depression, and low self-esteem. Listen to this one. I think this is really good. The inability to forgive. The counselee must first forgive himself. Vengeance is never our responsibility. Don't beat up on yourself. But I want to tell you something. People that have a hard time forgiving others usually have low self-image. They feel that somehow carrying the debt that someone else owes them makes them more valuable. But it doesn't. I think the bitterness comes and, and this lack of forgiveness is a lot have to do with the inferiority. People that can forgive others have experienced forgiveness of themselves and know that they're accepted in Christ. It is only with God's help that we can forgive. Now, we're going to stop here for today, but we have one more section. I always have my acrostic. So I'm going to give you V-I-E-W, the right view of you. And the V-I-E-W is going to be the way that I would counsel someone with inferiority. I think you'll be really great. And then I'm going to read you a story that I think that uh, will be just a real blessing to you as well. And then you will have one more test after we finish on the inferiority. So it'll be on anger and Uh, inferiority and this acrostic, the view and the acrostic on anger, A-N-G-E-R as well. All right, so we have one more lecture on on inferiority and then there'll be a test. We'll, We'll get you ready for the test as well in the next lecture. Okay, good to see you guys.